Welcome all. Uh, thank you for attending tonight. So now is uh, introduce Jodie Rizet, who's our senior consultant with Rural Solutions. Uh, she can give us some background on, on Sheep Connect and introduce main presenter Mike Avery. Apart from Jodie's obviously extensive qualification, she also comes from a very practical background. Jodie grew up in the southeast on a family farm and now lives and works a serial livestock property in, in Central Air Peninsula and is based in our Minipur office. So I will hand over to Jody, who will give you a bit, bit more of a rundown on Sheep Connect. Thanks, Philippa. Um, as Philippa said, the program tonight is brought to you by Sheep Connect SA um, and I'm the Pastoral Region Coordinator um, for that program. And Philippa asked me to mention the beautiful photo you see there is actually from our wool on our property. So um, it's a photo I took at our recent shearing. So just a bit of background about what is Sheep Connect. So Sheep Connect is um, an extension project run by Primary Industries and Region South Australia, looking um, for opportunities for producers to do practical programs where they can make positive change to their farm production and management practices. And that's focused both in the um, pastoral area but also in the agricultural areas of South Australia. If you want to know a bit more about Sheep Connect, we have a Sheep Connect website, so um, sheepconnectsa.com.au and you can also follow us on Twitter. We couldn't um, have this webinar tonight or part of the other programs that are presented by Sheep Connect SA without the support of numerous funding bodies. Um, so we'd like to thank them, AWI, PERSA, the Sheep Industry Fund um, and the NRM Board, South Australian Arid Lands and um, SA Murray Darling Basin. Um, just a disclaimer, PERSA, um, from PERSA about liability or responsibility for any information that you may hear and um, is presented tonight. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, Mike Avery. Mike is the partner at Southern Aurora Wool um, and has been there for a number of years. He's got over two decades of experience in the wool industry and holds a number of industry positions. And um, they have included being a director at the Australian Wool Exchange for um, six years. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Mike to present tonight's webinar on um, forward pricing of wool. Good, thanks a lot, uh, Jody. Um, well, we'll get into it fairly quickly because we've got a number of uh, slides to go through. Uh, I'll quickly uh, just give you a rundown of uh, our company. Uh, who we are, obviously, is uh, Southern Aurora, and our job is to uh, provide solutions in agricultural commodity markets. Um, what we do, we offer uh, brokerage in OTC products, but also in physical commodities and futures and options and foreign exchange. Uh, we also do uh, development for Ryman on uh, different OTC products, and we have uh, a, uh, a advisory structured finance wing. Uh, we're currently looking at a few other new products. Uh, they include cotton, uh, revamping the current uh, cattle contract. Uh, also, lamb's not on there, but it should have said meat rather than cattle. Uh, canola, we're looking at dairy and water at the moment. Uh, that's just a view of uh, the guys and girls that are involved. We'll move on quickly and get into what we want to talk about is, is wool and forward pricing. Um, I always like to start with a mission statement or something, and that is that the, the value of certainty is more important than the fear of lost opportunity. And I think that's uh, an important place to start because uh, we are talking about uh, forward pricing and, and certainty in a, in a uh, business that uh, has a lot of uh, volatility. Uh, I'll just quickly give you a definition on uh, what is price risk management and the types of contracts and obviously what that's the key to what uh, you want to hear tonight. Uh, price risk management is uh, all about uh, margin management. It's not trying to, to pick the top of the market or uh, anything that. If, uh, if we could do that, life would be very easy. But it's about managing price and uh, because price is not necessarily the most important factor to a successful business. Uh, it's managing margin. 
and historically wool, um, like most uh, agricultural commodities, are very volatile. And that volatility makes forecasting, budgeting and cash flow management diff difficult and affects how a business is perceived and also its long-term uh, sustainability. Hedging is a price risk management uh, strategy that's designed to minimise exposure to market risk that's associated with changes in supply and demand and price. Uh, hedging products such as wool forwards, they need to be simple and hopefully at the end of this you'll see that they are, but they've got to be versatile in their application. And it's intended just to reduce risk and, and increase stability. Uh, the types of forward contracts, physical forwards, you're obviously uh, um, been accustomed to that come via the, the uh, broker. Uh, we've got the OTC forwards that are based on uh, the AWEX MPGs, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. And also, hopefully, if we have time, uh, cover options, which uh, you've, you've probably been presented as uh, minimum price contracts. The physical forward uh, contract is where the, the goer the grower uh, contracts through his, through his broker or an individual exporter deliver uh, their wool sometime in the future to agreed specifications. Now, as you know, with wool, those key parameters are you know, micron length, strength, uh, vegetable matter, yield, style, and all these present issues uh, because of the relevant premiums and discounts that are, that are attached and uh, assessed by the individual uh, Purchaser. And that's where the, the, the downside in the, the, um, the physical forward, because the buyer needs to consider all these parameters and factor in his own premiums and discounts if wool falls outside those species. Uh, and the buyer needs to consider those risks involved and formulate a, a uh, premium discount schedule accordingly. That differs from the Ryman over-the-counter product is what we're talking about tonight, because it's, it's cash settled. It's independent, it's based against the uh, AWIX exchange uh, nominated price guides. It's the midpoint of the North and South MPGs. Uh, we do a few uh, bespoke uh, contracts based ex-West for some of our Western Australian uh, clients. But uh, the ones we're talking about tonight are the ones that are the screen traded, so the the uh, bids and offers are visible through an, an app or on your uh, laptop. They're a wholesale product, so therefore it's a business to business where the grower via their wool broker goes direct to the exporter and processor. There's no uh, premium discount schedule attached because they're based against the MPG and the premiums and discounts are ascertained at the time when you will sold, not against that particular contract. So the grower sells at auction on the agreed maturity date and receives the marketplace premium discount. Uh, and the profit or loss is uh, then applied to their total account sale, whereas yeah, they may have hedged uh, 20 bales of wool against uh, their 200 bale clip that they've sold at that time. and the the uh, profit or loss on that hedge of that 20 bales will be attributed to their account sale. There also is the ability, obviously, to buy that back uh, contract back should the uh, occasion arise. Now, we'll just talk about the market dynamics and how uh, the exporter is, is, is pricing. The exporter and processors are looking at the drivers of the market. And as a producer, I think that's what uh, you also need to do when you're formulating your strategies so you can regulate your returns just as the, the same as the exporter and processor do. And uh, they use those uh, forward hedging to manage their margins rather than margin their margins, as it says on the screen there, uh, to, uh, to um, reduce their risk exposure to adverse market movements. The exporter prices his bids based on their greasy sales or the expectation of those sales. And the export tends to trade both sides of the market, depending on the changes in the supply and de demand dynamics. They use it a way to, uh, for, to, to
to increase their position, uh, whether it's a bought or sold position based on, on where they're going. Uh, processes, on the other hand, tend to uh, to be to come uh, traditionally from just the buy side, where they're looking at that, uh, that that pricing basis, the sales of their tops, yarns, and and finished goods. Hopefully, you're getting these screenshots in the same order that I'm seeing them. Um, that's just a cut of uh, the AWEX da daily uh, price guide, which comes out the evening after uh, every auction, which gives you the price for the spot market of that day and the movement. So that's uh, that's available through AWEX every sale day. What you uh, will see on your app and uh, your screen is is what that market, the forward market looks at. And that's just a, a screenshot that's up there now of what the major microns are uh, we do deal from 18 through to 30 microns, uh, not all the microns, but 18, 18 and a half, 19, 19 and a half, 21, 22, 23, 28 and 30. So a fairly wide coverage, not always uh, the best way to do things according to the purists, because you tend to uh, uh, move liquidity away from, from a standard. Uh, those of you that have been in the business a long time will remember the, the original SFE or City Futures Exchange contract. Wool was the first traded uh, contract on the futures exchange going back to the 1960s. Uh, there was only one wool type that was traded and that was a, a, a 21 micron. Everyone, all growers had to uh, look at their own basis, uh, and we'll get on to what basis means, against a 21. So if you were growing 19 microns, you only had a 21 micron uh, contract to hedge. Uh, when we developed these contracts, the feedback from the grower side was that there needs to be more variety to reduce that basis, and exporters have taken that on board and are uh, bidding accordingly. That's just a shot of what uh, the app screen looks like, which obviously hasn't got the same detail. Uh, the one you're looking at is for uh, 21 microns. Each each micron has its own screen, so it hasn't got quite the, the same capability or the same uh, depth that uh, that is applicable in uh, the other screens. Now, the other major uh, contract that is that is dealt is our options. Now, this is usually a, a topic that uh, has people uh, glazing over because it's a, uh, uh, it can be presented as a very difficult uh, concept. It really is, is fairly simple. It is uh, very similar to an insurance product. What is is a guaranteed minimum price contract and whether the price premium is determined according to time, a strike price, volatility, the current at the money price, which is the where the futures price is for that uh, time. And it is what is termed a, a put option and what you probably have seen as, as uh, delivered by uh, your, your uh, brokers as a minimum price contract, and that's what it is. It gives the grower the right, but not the obligation to have a sold contract sometime in the future. And for this right, they pay, pay a premium, and, and just like an, an insurance premium. The grower chooses the date, which is aligned to their projected auction date, and he chooses a price level where he'd like to take protection. Now, that price level uh, is a big driver of what that strike price or premium would, would be. Uh, the seller of the contract, which is usually an exporter, will price the premium based on their view of the market, the uh, relativity of the strike price to the current futures price, which is the at the money price, and the current spot. And they'll use the implied volatility and the time to maturity. Now, um, Volatility is is uh, a complex thing. Um, it is derived, uh, well, 
actually the the mathematicians that uh, that derived uh, volatility, uh, guys called Black and Scholes, got the uh, Nobel Prize for mathematics. So that will probably give you an idea of how complicated it is. But it looks at the movement of price over time and uh, has a complex uh, mathematical formula behind it to imply uh, volatility to that market. Um, when I was first looking at futures, probably 25 years ago, I went to a seminar and was told, asked what was the uh, the most volatile commodity that was traded on the world uh, soft commodities market at the time. And uh, fortunately, uh, wool wasn't the highest uh, volatile market. It was the second highest. Uh, the most volatile was onions. I thought, oh, well, at least I'm not working in onions. Um, these models all incorporate these factors and they guide the buyer and the seller to ascertain where fair fair value is and where fair value is is what what the 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 market is predicting the insurance premium should be and as you know it's fairly uh, evident the more time you put into a, uh, a minimum price contract the uh, the higher the uh, strike uh, sorry the um, the premium will be. It's just like if you want to insure your car for six months, it is less expensive than insuring it for um, for 12 months. And the same thing about the volatility. If you consider volatility like the uh, incident of, of accidents, and so that's why if you are fortunate like myself to have uh, young drivers in the family, your premium is much higher than if they're older drivers because the occurrence of something happening, the volatility of the chance of an accident is higher for them. So it's really not a complex uh, concept if you break it down into into that, uh, that idea of it being an insurance product. But the key and why um, some growers use a, a mixture of both options and forward pricing uh, outright forward pricing is that the option has that upside for the grower uh, where they're just looking to guarantee uh, against uh, an adverse event uh, but are still in the market because they have the option and not the obligation to take up that sold contract whereas in a, an outright you, ha you have sold a contract so you have the obligation to, uh, to deliver so it's deliver the wool, but to, but to uh, contract that, that price. Mark, if I might just interrupt you there briefly with a couple of questions. Um, so we've yep. got, is there, a, is there a general percentage that you find a grower's contract of the total clip? Uh, yes, I'll, uh, I, was, I was going to get to that, but we'll get to that now. Uh, usually in a, in a, uh, a hedging strategy, um, and we'll talk about some of those strategies a little later. Uh, growers will start off at, at shearing, looking at their next season, and they'll either have price targets or they'll have uh, time targets where they like to hedge forward, let's say 12 months out. They'll do their first percentage, and that might be as low as 5% or 10% of their clip uh, within the, the first two or three month window, then another 10% in the uh, three to six month window, and then another 10 uh, in the uh, the six months to uh, up to closer to the shearing date. And so they'll look at pricing two or three or four times along that curve to a total around about, I'd say for those that are actively involved in the contract, they're looking at doing no more than about 30% of, um, of their clip. You know, they're just they're taking that they're uh, getting that certainty around around some of it. And whether that is to, um, of course, it's price driven, uh, and we'll look at some of those those drivers a little later. But if the prices are very very high and well above their cost of production, they may choose to have that percentage a little bit higher. And where that sits in history, but in sort of an average market, you're looking around about thirty percent. And Mike, um, you mentioned earlier with the no obligation situation. So if something horrendous were to happen in regards to 
uh, some sort of natural disaster, fire, etc., um, you're not uh, obligated to fill those contracts? That, for an option, yes. For an outright, no, you, you need, you're need you going to be cash settled against that. You have a contract that says, I've sold for next December uh, 20 bales, just like if you had a, a physical forward contract. You've got to meet that obligation. An option is you have the option. They're the, diff, the, the main difference between the two. So let's say you, you uh, bought a... Uh, 21 microns are currently, say, say 1887. So a 1700 option for uh, December at 30 cents, then you would pay a premium of 30 cents, and you have the the option of uh, of if the market was to fall below 1700, of uh, of uh, triggering that option and taking that sold futures because it's going to finish in the money. Uh, if if it doesn't, then nothing happens. It's out, out of the money. You've paid your 30 cents premium or whatever it was, and you've paid your insurance, nothing happens. It's a little bit like uh, you know, being happy that uh, you insured the car, but you didn't have an accident, but you've got the insurance behind you. If you do have an accident, you've, you've got there. In this case, the accident is that the market fell to $10 and you have a sold contract at $17. And so, yeah, but the the bonus for the option is that should say the price stay at uh, 1880, where it is today for 21 microns, then uh, you will have not the, if you'd taken a, an outright forward contract at $17, then Yes, you would get for 100 percent of your clip 1880 if the price stayed stable till December, uh, but you would pay out 180 cents against that forward price. Uh, so you, in that case, you would have been far better taking a 1700 put option and paying away 30 cents. So the option gives you the opportunity to uh, get the upside of the market should it stay there and get the upside not just on your total clip, the 70 or 80% that you that's unhedged, but also on the 20% or 30% that you did hedge with an option, you uh, also can uh, can be involved in that, having paid away 30 cents. So you're getting no deduction from your uh, from your outright. Hopefully that explains it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mark. It's it's a very uh, you know it it is isn't uh, an easy easy concept to uh, understand where as you know when you're looking at uh, pricing your your clip with a uh, an outright uh, forward sale what you're doing is is locking in uh, some of your clip at that price and 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 saying okay fine and we'll look at some some numbers that are on there. Uh, later on where where prices are forward and so you you're looking at at basically hedging some of your cost of production against uh, against the forward market should there be there something happen but, uh, and I guess the next uh, statement really sums up how uh, I won't say difficult uh, the process is, but uh, of of uh, wading through um, or navigating the, the the future, and that's uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the uh, American uh, Secretary of State, uh, once made a quote and said, "There are known knowns, there are things that we know, and there are known unknowns. That is to say, the things we know we don't know, but there are also unknown knowns." and there are things that we don't know we don't know. Now, that might seem incredibly confusing at the time. Poor Mr Rumsfeld was was uh, very much derided for saying something until people actually looked at it and thought about it. And if you relate that to the wool market, then we do have a lot of known knowns. We have current and historical prices in wool and competing fibres. 
We have current historical supply and demand. We have via the forwards a forward curve and growers know their cost of production. So there's a lot of things we actually know or we can get our hands on knowing. What we don't, what the unknowns that we know are, uh, here's a bit of a tongue twister, Mr. Rumsfeld, but uh, they're the future supply and demand and that's going to be impacted by weather, price, currency, uh, global macroeconomics, government policy. These things that we know happen, but uh, we're not so sure about. And that's what risk management is all about, by trying to wade through those things we, 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 uh, we know that we need to try and uh, get out. And one, uh, Mr Rumsfeld, unknowns, unknowns, which was about uh, I think uh, uh, probably, uh, what was it, uh, weapons of mass destruction. We, we had our own, fortunately it didn't in, 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 uh, impact Australia when the, the black swan events, which are these known unknowns. In 2010, we had Rift Valley fever in South Africa and um, all of South African wool was quarantined by China. So all the demand for wool or the supply that was possible for out of South Africa was, uh, there was a moratorium. And the outcome we saw in Australia was quite advantageous to us through September of 2010 through to July, where you'll see a chart where the market went at that time. Now, not all of that was, was on that, but that was really something, it was a black swan event that pushed the price of wool up because supply globally, although Australia is by and far the largest supplier of, of merino wool, um, South Africa is, it was at that stage a, a significant supplier into, uh, into uh, Europe particularly and into, into, uh, into China. And Mike, we've got a question here that's uh, probably on a bit we were just discussing prior to, but it says, um, should the options be used closer to sale of wool or as a tool to use throughout risk management strategy? And uh, this grower has just said that uh, it has been some advice that they've received from brokers. Uh, if if um, the volatility is not uh, so high and prices are you know, low, and the projection is prices uh, may go higher, then then options can be a very good value, uh, using the word option again, uh, choice for a grower to make um, because of, of that fact that they can be involved in the upside of the market. At the moment, uh, and, and as the question leading to the question, um, the closer you get to maturity uh, affects uh, the uh, impacts on the on the premium quite significantly, so they will probably look more attractive closer to uh, the shearing date than than well into the future, because the un, unlike a uh, an outright where the 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 seller of the option, which is usually the the exporter, he's he can't put that directly into his export book, not the full value of it. He can only put a percentage of it, and that percentage is actually quite is quite significantly tied to the time factor. And the the time is one of the big drivers of the cost of the premium. Just as as I said, if you compare it to um, insuring a car, if you're only insuring for, for for six months, it's half as cheap as 12 months. In options, that's pretty much uh, the same. It's not exactly linear, but it's it's close to it. And uh, and so it may it may prove uh, from a price point of view uh, better uh, to do it close. We did one very close to shearing uh, uh, the other day when the premium was was very low and the strike was was close oh, close to the market. But the grower was just he, he was he was only six weeks out from shearing. We were at uh, 1900 cents but the market very volatile for 21 microns and he was looking just to to take some cheap insurance you know if you look at 
20 cents on 1900 cents, it's fairly cheap as a percentage. Uh, just in case one of these black swan events uh, or uh, something uh, impacted, whether it be uh, currency or something, yeah, government policy, you know, there's a fair bit of risk out there in the world of government, maybe not just our government, but you know, if we could give a, an example of, of Mr. Trump you know, talking about uh, trade, trade embargoes or a trade war, you know, that could impact uh, us significantly, even, even though uh, we're not directly involved, the, the kick on from something like that. So he was looking at a, a very short term option just so uh, he, he was happy to pay away 20 cents because uh, you know, if the price of wool fell a dollar, he, uh, he wanted to make sure that uh, he had some, some cover over some, some big event highly unlikely and when something's highly unlikely just like in any insurance business it is the the cost of it is quite cheap so uh, it's I, I think for a grower uh, if the price is right options are are um, uh, a, a, a good strategy it's it's just liquidity an issue and and uh, and getting close to that fair value uh, model if it if uh, if you know the volatility and uh, and the time, then it's it's easy to calculate using a model to say what is a fair premium, and um, you assess you know what um, and that that premium is driven obviously by price, and you might want to just say okay, um, I'll take a well out of the money option, so so a strike price well below where the current level is. But I just want insurance in case something uh, outrageous happened to the market. But I would think on a on a ratio, we're probably doing 90% forward prices against uh, about 10% of options. Um, when the market was was moving in upward scale 12 months ago, that percentage was probably higher on the options. Um, exporters had a view that the market was was going to continue up and were quite happy to write options. At these current historically high levels, um, you know, the writer of the option is is really on a hiding hiding to nothing. If you know they're aggressive with their premiums, because uh, you know we had a couple of instances in the last uh, week or two, if we're talking on say 19 microns, where we saw the price decline uh, over six selling days well over 100 cents. Now, if um, if an exporter had priced an option with a premium of, of even 50 cents, uh, he's lost his, uh, he's lost most of his premium, um, or not lost his most of his premium, but the, the strike price had fallen below. He, um, he's, he's got very little reward in that he captures the premium, just like any insurance, you pay it up front. He's captured say 50 cents premium and he's seen the price start to fall back down to the strike level or past the strike level so it's it's quite a risky proposition riding options at the top of the market and and they're they're currently priced accordingly hopefully that uh, covers that question yes thank you Mike no worries and what we're talking about in this, all this data, it's out there and available through your local broker or through the National Council, AWEX, AWI and, and Ag Consultants. It's just, uh, you know, the job of the, of the grower to, uh, to press uh, his, his brokers to make sure he's, uh, he's well informed. And, you know, I get uh, a lot of that uh, data through from the brokers and they're, they're pretty good at doing that uh, and, and making growers aware of it. But if there's any particular stuff that, uh, that, that uh, growers need, it can, it can be sourced. This might be a good time no. to even um, uh, tell our, uh, our attendees about the handouts that we've got there um, in reference to elders and landmark and quality wool that they can download um, at any any time they choose and uh, have a look at it later. Um, just to refer back to uh, yeah, what you were just saying there, Mike. 
Yeah, and those those um, that data I'm talking about, I do know are available on all three of those uh, companies' websites that you've uh, that you've said those da those daily and weekly reports. Uh, they're they're all there, and and yeah, not not uh, on a daily basis. Some of the other historicals. Um, I'll just go through a, a few examples of of why, um, you know, or a visual really of why risk management is uh, is a necessary or not necessary tool, but I think an advantageous tool for looking at at managing margins. Um, this is the longest dated chart that I could get, which was on not not well. This is 19 microns, but that dates back uh, longer than Jody uh, happily informed everyone I'd been in the wool industry. Um, so that's that's almost uh, oh, it's 42 years of data, and you can see the peaks and troughs that we've had over time. Um, we'll go through a few others. Um, if we look at a shorter time frame, this last decade. You can see 18 microns has, has gone through the best part of a thousand cents in that time. Um, that's just a chart on connects all those those finer microns, and you can see the movement is is in a pattern which when which we spoke about earlier where there was only one uh, micron that was uh, uh, hedgeable from the SFE. And the reason behind that is you'll see that 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 the price movements are uh, for wool in in uh, concert with each other uh, until you break them down. So you actually it lo all looks quite regular, but if you break it down, we'll, we'll discuss in a few minutes because uh, we haven't got a lot of time about basis between the microns and how that can be used. But that's why there's hedging. The underlying product is more important than getting the basis absolutely right. Uh, having said that, we now have a variety of products which can which can eliminate some of that uh, that basis. The other data we're talking about is is from a historical point of view how to look at it. This is what's called a percentile chart, um, and it just gives you a reflection over the last. I've cut it back to two years because I think if we go back further, some of these numbers, uh, this is the move, the upward movement. So even in this short time frame, you'll see that we're currently sitting on some of these these uh, microns, or all of them except for 30 microns in the 85 percentile or higher, which means that for 85% of the time, prices have been lower than this over these, the last two years. And if we will look at this uh, over a, a decade period, then you find that the majority of the of the merinos ha, are now sitting still in their 95 percentile band for the last decade. But I think that's that we need to reflect on you know the last two years more importantly because that's where we've we've set things. But it goes to show that even in that period, that there is considerable uh, downside from here to get even the average price of the last two years for 18 microns. It's it's 250 cents under here, and when we get to a basis chart, uh, you can see that it's over or just over 400 cents from the from the average on 21 microns, which is uh, really very significant. And if we look at uh, just some prices without the the, uh, the visuals, the 21 microns, the average over the uh, the last eight years is 1,270 cents, with a low of, of just under 900, and a high of uh, 19. That's actually not correct. The high was 1938. Oh, that's uh, yeah. So that didn't change that that last six months. It broke that previous high, so we are talking about a volatile commodity and something that that we need to address uh, as uh, as growers. If in principle we're happy to accept the pricing of the work that we do for 12 months from one single day on that sale day, or now 
I know there's multiple occasions people sell across the year with with uh, with more than yearly shearing, but the the principle is that we should be looking at pricing, uh, you know, the work done over the year on more than one occasion. It's just a, a clip of the um, of the uh, indicative forward grid. You'll notice that it's still in quite severe backwardation, uh, and a lot of that's been on the back of of where where we've travelled, especially on the finer microns, um, where it's come back over the last uh, few weeks. So now, if we just talk about what are the the key, I think, are the key drivers in trying to to develop a strategy, and they're they're different for every enterprise, and but they need to relate to the cost of production. Uh, risk appetite and the impact, if any, on the cost of financing because that's what uh, the banks we're talking to are now looking at, at that volatility, especially at these levels. And, you know, uh, they want to um, move risk around and are happy to uh, price financing based on some uh, strategy of, of uh, risk minimisation. Uh, we're actually getting close to time, so I'll run through these fairly fairly quickly. They're just the type of, of strategies, and this is really just textbook examples of, of what happens in other commodities and what, what strategies are about, whether they're survival, adaptive control, or hedging strategies. Um, I spoke about basis, and I'd just like to ex explain that. It refers to the difference in the product that's being hedged to the underlying contract. So when we had the SFE contract, if you're a 19 micron wool grower, you're hedging 21. Uh, the basis was a difference between those two and that chart we showed before, that they, they do move in line, but they actually do shift out when you break them apart. In the case of wool, it's the difference between your clip and the underlying MPG that you're going to hedge with and for the export of the type they're delivering against that MPG. So the, you don't, they, the export doesn't deliver to China on 21 micron. The MPG delivers a type 55. And for a grower, the clip will, might be around 21 microns. It won't be exact, but it will be a relative or a basis to that. And in most cases, it's best to minimise that basis and therefore hedge to that nearest MPG. But sometimes it's important to look at at basis uh, to see if you might get some strategic advantage. Now, this will give you an idea of what that that basis can can look like. This is just between two of the finer microns. And you'll see in 2011, that basis got to near on up 500 cents, and we almost got back that again. So that means the difference between an 18 micron wool and a 19 micron wool is 500 cents. So it was fairly important at that stage to be uh, hedging your, close enough to your production as you could. Whereas down in the lower section over a couple of years, especially in, in sort of 2014, when that basis got very, very low, then an 18 micron wool grower would be far better off hedging 19 microns when the basis is, is, is almost nothing. If that basis, is out there in the forward market, then it's better to, to hedge the broader micron because more likely than not, it will shift up from that basis, not, uh, not down. Uh, it did get close to zero, but never touched zero. Um, and we'll see that in also in 21 microns where yeah, that basis again got down to sort of 20 or 30 cents against 21. So at that stage, it would have been best to do 21 against 18 instead of that. Whereas at its peak in 2011, it got to a thousand cents. So, uh, and again, 21s, you 19 to 21, you'll see that it has moved violently, but it is now heading back in uh, in the other direction. I'm close to concluding, so I could have a few questions. Um, the ongoing key, of course, in all of this is is education. And uh, just to 
to sort of put it in, in broad terms. Um, from the selling side, wool brokers that are participating in the Ryman market represent around 90% of the volume that goes through auction. So the, they are very active, but probably only half of those brokers are, 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 are very active participants. On the exporting side, the same thing. Around 75% exporters represent about 75% of the wool shipped, but the majority is only probably traded by about 25%. So we need education on both sides of that. And the real killer for, for, for wool, unlike uh, grains, cotton, is that only about 2% of the underlying clip is, is hedged. And I think uh, Jody asked the, the or Philip asked the question about you know, what is a normal strategy. Well, that's probably closer to 30% for an individual grower. So if you look at that, uh, then individual growers were probably looking at, at only about 1% of, of individual growers or less using the contract because the guys that are using it are, are hedging around about 20 to 30% of their clip. And Liquidity for everyone is the key to uh, delivering accurate and uh, and fair forward pricing. And I always like to finish with uh, the same mission statement. Um, we need to look at valuing certainty, uh, which is more important than, than the fear of, of lost opportunity because uh, uh, none of us can predict what the future is going to be. Thanks. Right. Well, thanks very much, Mike. Is there any uh, any further questions that while we have Mike's valuable time, if you want to, yet yeah, just uh, jot them down in that in that question box, and I can certainly pass on to him. Um, also worth mentioning that uh, the we invited the brokers to provide the information in that uh, handout section. So absolutely download them and have a look and. I suggest if you want any further information to, to contact your broker directly. But yes, if there's any other questions, if they would like to come in fairly quickly, um, we're, we're reaching the end of our, our session time and we're always very conscious of, of not going over people's time. Again, just a reminder that we will be sending out a recording of this, a link to the recording that you can listen to it at your leisure. So we, yes, we highly recommend that you do that, especially if there are items or bits that you missed or um, if like me, your line speed chops out in and out a bit, you can at least then go back and reflect on all the great advice that Mike gave us. I will on, on finishing up just firstly thank Mike for his very uh, precious time, especially seeing we've pulled him back from Easter at Byron Bay to do this, which is very kind of him to, to uh, give us his time. Um, and uh, along with, with Mike and, and Jodie, of course, we would like to, on behalf of PESA and AWR Sheep Connect and Natural Resources SA Arid Lands, like to thank you all for attending. We hope you've really enjoyed it. At the end of uh, the session, there will be a, a couple of questions that we'd love you to answer. Just makes it easier for us to know what type of topics you're looking at next time. And we found that these webinars are just getting more and more popular. So we find it an excellent tool for, for passing on information to a wide audience. Um, so if there's nothing more, and we've got a couple of comments coming in, Mike, about the fact that it's a, yeah, been a great session and most, most valued. So that's fantastic. So anyway, so thank you very much again for, for logging on and attending. And we look forward to having you again at our next webinar. Thanks very much. <laughs>